everybody. Welcome to another chapter of the Book of Sean. Had a couple of technical difficulties right there, but we got over it, okay? Don't be judging us. You ain't all together holy yourselves. Anyway, got a great show for you tonight. My brother Antoine Miller is here, and he is an interesting example of how sometimes you want to do something, and you want to do good, and you want to help people. But sometimes you don't always get the support you need to get it done. And it's not because people are against you. Sometimes you don't get support because the people you're trying to help can't support you. And it's not their fault. It's because sometimes they live in the country. And in this case, they live in the country where poverty is grinding and trauma is real. What do you do when you're trying to give birth to a dream and you seem to be pushing all by yourself. Hmm? Do you keep pushing? Do you move on to something else? Do you pick up another thing? This is what my brother's here to figure out, and I'm gonna help him think his way through it, okay? And as I work with him, I'm gonna be working with you too, because there are some things that you are trying to do, and you don't get the support that you need. And I know sometimes you feel like giving up, but I want you to understand, the giving up may not be the best decision, okay? We'll figure it out. Anyway, welcome to the show tonight, my brother, Antoine Miller. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much for having me, and I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight. I'm excited to have you. I'm very, I think, honored to be able to tell parts of this story. Um, so I want to get into it because I think we need to you know, give people the lay of the land. You're here tonight because your dream, your passion, kind of puts you at odds, not with people, but with resources, right? Um, because we often think that we have conflict with people, but you could have conflict with resources when you don't have them. Here's my question. Talk to me about what your dream is all about. What are you trying to do? Well, what I'm trying to do is to have a program that's positively engaged. Um, with the program, we are most definitely trying to send all our kids to college. Where We have a, a goal in mind right now where we're trying to take 100 kids over to London to perform at what's called London's Band Week. And uh, one of the main challenges we have right now is just fundraising the funds that's needed to, you know, to carry all of these kids over for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that you know, that can most definitely be beneficial to each student. You know, this is something that they can add to their college resume, you know, and it's just a trip of a lifetime. So that right now is one of our biggest uh, things. And our, our ultimate goal is just to continue to have a positive program within our community that keep kids off of the street mm. while at the same time preparing our, our youth, you know. Okay, so Antoine, stop community. for a second. So Because so I, mm -hmm. I want people to have a sense of what the program is. What is the program? Okay. Sure. So the Sounds of Success is a nonprofit uh, 501c3 program where we are. We're a local program partnering with our school district and we train kids ages 5 to 23 how to play instruments. Uh, we do, as mentioned, have a homework help program. We do help kids to get in college. So it's basically a community marching band for those schools that lack resources of having a community or uh, having a marching band on their campus. OK, stop, because I love that. <laughs> I absolutely love I love it, I lo and I'll tell you why. Because I believe that the arts, music, dance, literature, poetry, all of it, might be the only thing that saves us. It might be the only thing that makes us human. And it might be the only thing that some kids get to have access to that helps them deal with their trauma. So I love that. I love, I mean, shout out to you, man. That, you really, right. you really should be applauded and said, that smile, I love that. Why are you smiling? What are you feeling? When I say that, what are you feeling? Well, right now I'm just feeling excitement. You know, I, I do feel hope. I'm, I'm one that has strong faith and belief. So no, 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 stop, have... stop, stop. When I'm asking you, when I said that to you, your smile, flashed across your face. In the moment tonight, when I was celebrating you, what were you feeling? Joy, there inspiration. You there you go. Yeah, that's it, that's it. And by the time we're done, we're gonna make that feeling what you consistently feel, okay? My goal at the end of this conversation is to make that your new story. But let me ask you this. 
Um, out of all the things you could be doing, out of all the programs you could be participating in, why this program? Why do you want to do this? What is it about this, this program, this, this work that speaks to you? It's music in general. Mm. And music is something that can touch a person's emotions and how a person feels. Mm. I believe that that's what probably kept me, you know, engaged and moving forward in school as well, because I was engaged in band. You know, I am also a product of my environment. You know, and uh, we do lack resources when we know where we're from. But a band is something that, like, if a person that uh, from a family who who may not have the funding that may be required to get into high school, a band can help a child, as myself, get into college. So to me, that's my that's my fuel. That's what keeps it going. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about myself. It's about the youth. These are the next ones that's you know in line to help move the world forward. So everything that I do is for the community and for our youth. Yeah, I love that. And you said something that I want to drill down on. How does this work that you're doing now connect to your story? It connects a lot. Um, one thing that I don't do, is I don't give up on our students. Uh, we do have some challenging situations, but how it connects to me is because when I look at these kids, I do see myself in a lot of them. I do see kids that have poor parents. I do see kids who don't have the resources. I do see kids that live in poverty. I do see kids that come to being hungry from day to day basis. And I also was one of those kids growing up. You know, I, I've experienced not being able to go on a band trip because I, my parents couldn't afford. They had to decide between paying a bill or sending me to, you know, for a, a weekend of fun. So that that that's how I can say I can't. Yeah, but you know, you know, I do Antoine, like Antoine, I'm actually I'm asking you a deeper question. Tell me how mm -hmm. music saved you. Man, music saves me in so many ways. So a save, brief thing that- Save, probably, past tense. How did music save you? When you were 12 and 14 and 16, how did music save you? It just kept me out of the streets. It kept me engaged. It kept me in moving to something positive. It saved me from many things. It saved me from hanging out on the streets. It saved me from hanging out with gangs. I mean, that's, that's all that's within our community, you know? So it pretty much kept me on the straight narrow. You know, it, it got me to where I am today. Hmm. So I know you've talked about some of the challenges and uh, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that a little more um, because that's in part why you're here. So as it relates to this, to this program, this dream, this desire to have music be the thing that protects and nurtures and grows our children, what are some of the challenges um, that the, that you face trying to make this opportunity for other people? No, so it will most definitely be financial resources. Um, you know, a lot of we we are like as mentioned in the low poverty areas. A lot of our parents they can't afford to they can't afford the expenses that comes with the band. You know, so money is most definitely a factor. Um, you know keeping the kids engaged as well, because a lot of times kids don't understand the, the culture of music until they actually start to understand how to play an instrument. So a lot of times we will train a kid or we'll think we're training a child and then it, it may not be for them and they may pull out. So, you know, it's a lot of different uh, challenges that we do face. I could say mainly it's financial and then having the support that we need to be a better program from our community. Mm. Now, let's talk about that second part, because I was just about to ask you, is it really the case that money is the biggest challenge? Here's what I've learned, and I'm, I've lived a little longer than you, that money is always part of the story. The biggest story happens to be what you just said. Now, drill down on that. When you say not getting the support you might need from the community, we're not talking about money. What are you talking right. about? Just in regards to just being present for the kids, you know, um, and not really too much talking about the money, but when it just comes to just simply less sharing the post, you know, getting the word out about what our goal and our mission is, or having certain people of power to come out and speak to the kids and keep them, keeping them encouraged, you know, mm. or it could be on the parent end, you know, so it, it's a lot of factors that go into the community uh, aspect, you know, without taking out the money, you know, it's just mainly just having a, a public figure within our city that should be present to keep these kids encouraged and let them know that they are on the track to doing the right thing. Yeah, now see, that that to me is the deeper issue, okay? And, and 
How does that make you feel? Here you are, you've dedicated your life to this, you're working hard to get it done, you're serving other people's children, and how does it feel for you not to get the support from the community that you're trying to help save? It's very, very discouraging. It is frustrating. There are times, if I have to speak my honest, where I do feel like I just wanted to drop the ball. Mm. You know, um, so it it, 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 it it is draining. It can be mm. very draining at times, and it can be very discouraging and frustrating. Mm. Mm. Let's, 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 let's give it some language, okay? Because I like this. Um, is it anger, frustration, disappointment? What is it? It's a bit of it's a bit of it all. It's a bit of everything. You know, at times you do become frustrated. As a director, you know, you can get frustrated if your show's not coming together, right? But at the same time, uh, it can be sad. It can it can be sad. To me, this is where I feel so the issue is. We're located in a black town, if I have to just call it out. And I personally believe that we have a lot of great high power African American male and female public figures within our city. I believe that if our youth saw more of people like myself or your stuff, or more people of color coming out and encouraging and supporting them, then we would have a better outcome within our youth within our community. So I just think that the presence of having just another African American, uh, you know, available of success it can most definitely uplift those within the community. So that's where I really deep in, dig in deep when I say community support as well. Yeah, I understand that. And, and since we're being honest, let's be honest some more. And I know you don't know, so I'm asking you to speculate. Why do you think they don't engage and are present at the level they should or could be? Yeah, I, that, that would be a tough answer. I, so a, a tough question to answer. I'm not really sure of the reason why, you know, we don't have the level of support in which we should. You know, I just know that it is most definitely very discouraging. And maybe it could be because of the people who I would like for them to come. Maybe they have busy schedules, whatever it could be. But I still believe, you know, with the amount of attention that we are bringing and, you know, what, the, what our mission and our goal is, it still would be great to still have a presence there. Hmm. You know, I'm gonna push you a little bit, okay? Because, okay. Is it, first, do I have your permission to push you a little bit? Yes. Okay, good. Um, because you are bright, you are smart, and I think on some level, you do know, or you do have some sense of why they don't support more. I think you're being diplomatic. I think you're being, you know, you're being kind, which I appreciate. But I also want you to, in a diplomatic kind way, really uh, bring to light why you think people don't stand up more um, when for people like you who are trying to help. But if something bad was happening, right, everybody right. would be there. I'm going to ask you again, right. see if I can squeeze another answer. Why do you think, and you're just thinking, but why do you think they don't support at the level they should or could? Well, I, it could be many reasons, but you called it out for one. One, I believe in the way that we're moving now as a culture of people, we've become so comfortable with hate that we sometimes, look, you know, we, 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 we draw more towards the negative than the mm. positive. You know, so we living in a world now where, like I said, we put hate first, not knowing that love is our strongest aspiration of our world. So I can't really, I can't really say why we are not getting the support. I don't think it's for anything of a personal nature, but I just believe it's so that, you know, I, I don't believe, I know for sure that it's just not there. You know, um, I, even given the example of Martin Luther King, I know this may be a little off topic, but he was one of the greatest voices for our people, but he still didn't have the support of his community as well. You know, there were times where he failed trials and, you know, he failed trouble, you know. So I don't think that it's nothing to do with what we're putting together. I think that it may just be something that we lack as a culture of people. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we, we come from a culture of slavery where we've been traumatized all of our life. You know, maybe that's just about it. Maybe it just could be a pillar tradition. Well, you know, you know what, you Antoine, know? Let, 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 let me jump in and add another part of that answer. Or maybe it's because people don't value music. They don't value the arts. They don't value children. They don't value what music can do in the life and the mind of a child. They think other things are important. They want to talk about the police and they want to talk about murder and they want to talk about crime. These things are important, there's no doubt about it. 
But this, right. it, what you're doing is also important. And the tragedy is we live in a culture and in a world where people don't value what it is you're trying to give birth to. I got to take a break, but let me say this. Here's what I know for sure. Just because other people won't clap for it doesn't mean that it's not a great thing. People who are dancing will always look crazy to people who cannot hear the music. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about living with a dream and trying to give birth to something in the absence of much of the support your dream, a dream might deserve. My guest tonight, Antoine Miller, knows that journey and that story because he's living it right now. Antoine, let me ask you this. Um, I want to hear about the kids a little bit because I like kids. Dr. Sean likes the kids. Um, <laughs> give me some of the best feedback or success stories that your program and initiative has created? Oh, man, there are many. So uh, for one, I would like to say uh, we were contacted by uh, the agency for Will Smith to do the Bel Air commercial theme uh, for both the Super Bowl and for his TV show, which uh, we they came and recorded us. It was a February of this past year. Uh, we also traveled to Atlanta, Georgia, in May, and we performed for the uh, drum line, the people who made the movie Drum Line. It, it was a jamboree um, in Atlanta, and we also performed for an, an event at Six Flags where we, you know, we won a first runner up. Uh, we participate each year at FAMU. I'm very big on taking my kids to HBCU. I believe they have to be exposed to that culture at a, at a very young age. So, I mean, we've done, with our short time, we have done some, you know, we've done many great things within the culture of, of our band program with more still to come. Do but a lot of your kids people, go on to uh, play in college bands as well? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Matter of fact, through the program, we actually, uh, we promote that we encourage, that we do help kids get into college. We do set up scholarships for kids to audition. We do help them with their auditions, and we do help kids with the level of getting into college. I we do that. have kids in the program that's in college right now as well. I love that. I love that. And congratulations about that. Do parents and community people tell you thank you? Thank you, rather? Is that something you hear often? Um, I do hear it a lot from my parents and my staff. Um, I would like to hear more from the community or just receive the type of recognition, I believe, you know, but I do get the support from the, the inner family of the band. And I, and of course, from my, my wonderful PR firm as well, they're also very encouraging as well. What about your, what, what, what about your family and friends? Do they tell you thank you? Um, my, my parents, you know, they're very proud of me now, which also makes me very proud. Um, friends, I, I, I'm more of a self person, you know, so, um, I have associates, but there are also other directors. So, okay, hold on, hold, hold on. Cause you just got my interest. What is, what do you mean? You're more of a self person. I just, I don't know. I feel as though I achieve goals, you know, when I'm by myself. When I'm by myself, I'm in a little zone. So, like, for example, when I'm at home and I'm by myself, I write all the music for the band. So it's time for me to focus. Or, you know, I just believe that sometimes certain things that people do can be a distraction, which is how we do become distracted in life. You know what I mean? So I just like to be by myself to keep myself focused on the business, which is, to me, the most important aspiration right now. Can I push you? Yes. Okay. I'm. I'm. I want to make sure because you know <laughs> I'll be pushing them. Somebody doesn't want to be pushed. Here's my push <laughs> on that. Um, I don't think you have that luxury in your line of work with this dream. I think you have to do both. I think you have to go into your closet, into your cave, and write and be brilliant and do your work and master those notes but you also have to be public and relational and social and create not just a band, but a community and a crowd and a movement. I think to really get to where you want to go, you have to invert that paradigm and come out of being a self and start being, and I know you already did this, but more of a public leader. When I say that, what comes to mind? In a public figure, you know, one that stands out for the community, a role model of excellence. And? 
I'm just one that just, you know, a public figure is just one that that just helps others to become successful as well. One that leads the nation, you know, to pretty much being an overachievers. Yes, hold on. First, I said public leader, not figure. But secondly, but secondly, when I say and, I was giving you a chance to drink some of what I was saying. And that is to be relational, to connect with people, to let people in, to let them be a part of it by telling them the story. You get it? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm saying, li listen, you're doing a great job. So I'm not, I'm not in any way critical. I'm just saying if there's a place where there's a growth if issue in, in terms of your own identity, it's not being a self, it's being a leader. And you can't lead if nobody else is there, <laughs> right. right? What do you call a leader with nobody following them? A man or a woman out taking a walk. <laughs> That's all they are. Wow. Your challenge now is to invite people in, to be social, mm -hmm. to say to your family and your friends, come be a part of this. Come be a part of this. Come watch this movement transform lives. Now, when I say that, what comes to your spirit? Why should it transform lives? I Meaning, it's helping each kid to be successful as possible, it's helping them to go to the next level of their lives. When I say that you should embrace that role more, what comes to your spirit? Being more, being more available, being more present within our community. Are you, you open know, to that? More... Are you open to that? Oh yes. Okay, oh, good. Yes. Good. All right. Listen, because I'm an introvert by nature. So, be, you know, being public and being out there is not my normal way of being in the world. So as soon as you said that, I could connect to that. But I also know to do what I do, I have to invite people in. I have to give people a chance. And maybe the support that you deserve will be the result and the consequence of you making more invitations, of asking more directly. See, at some point, you have to stop giving people the benefit of the doubt that they will on their own become a part of it. And sometimes you just have to directly ask and say, look, support this, support me, and care for these kids. And you'd be surprised at how some people were just waiting to be asked. I actually believe that concept. If I don't mind, I would like to share something with you as well. I have this philosophy where I used to have a philosophy where people would quit the band. And if I had to vent, when, when kids quit the band, that's very discouraging to myself and, and the staff. We feel like we put so much into it, you know, and it got to a point where people would quit the band, I would just let them go. But then I was starting seeing the numbers drop and it took everything because I'm not one to feel like I'm begging someone to come be part of, you know, the circle. But the numbers was going down so low where it took me out of my comfort zone where I had to start talking to parents and students and it started, you know, try to figure out what the issues were, mm. you know, and come to find out it was kind of myself. You know, I am a very stern, I am very strict and I do speak very harsh at times, you know. So um, I actually needed to hear that to humble myself a little bit. It was, it was through the humbleness that got the numbers back up. Mm. Now that's a great, that's a great story. And it's actually where we should started this conversation. It's amazing how this happens because I had no scripted intention of talking to you about this, but I really think what you just gave me is where the barrier is. It's being open, it's opening your heart and, and the willingness to be vulnerable, to say to the parents and to the community, listen, I need you. I need you, I love you, I wanna listen to you, and I wanna partner with you to do this. And I'm so glad to hear that that dire situation made you think about yourself. Right, right. Yeah. And I hear it from multiple people as well. I heard it from multiple people, you know, and I had this philosophy where if one person tells me something about myself, I kind of ignore it. If two people tell me, I bring it to light. But if three or more people tell me, then it has to be a true thing, you know? So, and I, to me, that's something that I had to work on because a, a, a true leader is not just about self, you know, especially if you're going to do business, you have to be willing to be open and listen to other ideas from people. And a lot of parents, and I, I'm so close-minded, that's direct their way in the past where everything had to be myself. 
even with my staff. Like yeah. I would write the music, I would do the formations, I would make the dance routine up because that's just the way I thought it should be. <laughs> But when you I were, sat back, oh, and Antoine, was, Antoine, <laughs> you were out of control, son. You were. You were totally out of control. You were. You were. I love you, but you were out of control. And here's the beautiful thing: you just said it. A true leader cannot be about self, right? Right. And then before you just admitted, not now, but before you just admitted that you were, I'm a self person. Well, if a, a true leader can't be about self. Then you can't right. be a true leader and be a self person, That's right. right? Yeah, no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. What's beautiful is is the illumination, right? The epiphany. But see, I had to train myself on. Right. But I had to train myself. That's okay. You have a team. It's okay to use your team. Right. And which it started to take stress off of me as well. Right. And I'm suggesting that you have more work in this area to do, because just like you invited the parents and uh, who have the alumni of the band to say more and your staff to do more, I'm saying you have to go out and engage your community and invite them in. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna do it. You're gonna I'm do it. Definitely yeah, you're gonna do it. All right, let's do this before I let you go, all right? I, we play a little game and this one okay. is called, you ready, Hiley? Which would you rather have? <laughs> okay. There we go. We need some music to that, Hiley, don't you think? Anyway, so I'm going to give you some options. I have a list of things, and you just tell me which, you would, which one of these things you would rather have, and then tell me why, all right? So, <laughs> Antoine, which would you rather have, support or greatness? Hmm. Mm. Support. Really? And the reason why is because what support will bring greatness. It'll, it's, it'll uplift you and make you feel encouraged. You gonna let people help you? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> you promise? I promise. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Antoine, which would you rather have? Security or adventure? Adventure, most definitely. Mm, tell me why. It's good to be adventurous sometimes. Sometimes being adventurous or you know, going out and being doing things can actually open up more opportunities it can it can you never know that's how relationships are are made by being adventurous you know so mm -hmm. most definitely think i'd take the adventure over security now you know i love you to death but i don't believe none of that i don't i don't, <laughs> I don't believe that you want no damn adventure but anyway we're gonna keep going i'm gonna bring you back we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about that all right which would you rather have people who have known you a long time or people who believe in you right now? People who believe in me right now. Tell me why. Your face changed. That's the first, hold on. That's the first time in this whole conversation I have <laughs> sensed some emotion from you. Why did your face just change? It's just because that's what I lack. You know, like, I, if, if No, no, if no, stop, stop, you, stop, stop. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not just what you lack. It's what you desire. It's what you I want. Do. Right. Right, you got to own it, Antoine. You got to own it. And, and that's what I saw on your face. Your soul connected with that. Did I get that right? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, let's do one more before I take this break. Which would you rather have, Antoine, yesterday or tomorrow? Most definitely tomorrow. Tell me why. Yesterday is in the past and everything that's done, you know, you can't change, but I do have a, what tomorrow is, is a, it's a vision. It gives me something to look forward to. And which, and then what, if I did mess up on yesterday, I can most definitely make it better than my tomorrow. Yeah, and you will, you will. Um, I hope and pray that this conversation is the beginning of a different way of being and leading and seeing yourself uh, because you're a good guy and you have a good Thank heart you, and your intentions are good. And um, it's just that sometimes how we lead is a reflection of what we know at the time. And I believe that after this conversation, you're gonna do better because now you know better. That's right, I believe that too, sir. Yeah, yeah, I like you, man. Hey, I wish you success and I wish you greatness. And I right, wish you the me. support that you deserve and need. Go ahead, respond. No, I was just saying I humbly thank you for the advice today because you did give me insight. You did let me see myself as well. So I thank you for your time as well because this was a beautiful conversation. See? 
Anybody who calls this a beautiful conversation can come back. <laughs> Antoine, <laughs> tell the kids I said hi. Listen, everybody, we're going to take this break. And when we come back, I'm going to do an aha moment because I got one from this great conversation with Antoine. And I want to share it with you right after this. Don't go nowhere. Welcome back, everybody. Um, aha moment. So did you notice when that whole conversation changed, right? Did you notice it? Whole conversation was going along, doing what it was doing. And then we got to a certain moment in that conversation I just had with Antoine where it opened up, right? You could feel the conversation open up. And what was that moment is when he made, I think inadvertently, a wonderful confession about himself. And that is that he's a self person. He's a self person in a position trying to lead something that requires that he collaborate with other people. Those two things don't go together. Now, you heard what I said to him, but what I didn't say, and it's really it's for him, it's for all of us. No leadership, no dream, no nothing will be successful until we are willing to do the hard work of preparing ourselves to have it. See, what you want is available. What you want is there for the asking, but it will never come into your life until you do the work of making room for it. And making room for it has nothing to do with the other people in your life. Sometimes it's about what's going on in your heart and spirit. You can't fill a life with love if it's already filled with resentment. You can't fill a life with collaboration and partnership if it's already filled with isolation and autonomy and individuality. Right? You cannot build something if you are committed in this season to doing nothing at all. Got to make, got to get ourselves ready for what it is we prayed for and what it is we're hoping to do and to become. And the moment we confess what we are not, what we are struggling with, what we are working to overcome, is the moment freedom happens. You will break into the next level of your life the moment you say, this is what I am struggling to manifest in me. Because giving it language, as Antoine did tonight, is how you beat it every time. Lord help us. Oh, why do I feel like throwing my shoe? <laughs> Let's do some ass, Dr. Sean Hiley. All right, you guys always send me great videos and uh, emails and direct messages. And I got a video and I want you to take a look, a look at it. My mouth is working. Hi, Dr. Sean. <laughs> My name is Sherry Jones and I'm from Toronto, Canada. My question is, how do I cope with the loss of losing a newborn baby? Last year, I was 30 weeks pregnant and I lost my pregnancy due to a genetic disorder called trisomy 13, which resulted in me losing my baby and a traumatic birthing experience, which landed me in the ICU needing a blood transfusion. I find it very hard to cope with this loss. I find it very hard to go on day by day mm. dealing with this loss. So I was wondering if you had any advice of dealing with the loss of a child. I would greatly appreciate that. Thank mm. you. Yeah, first, all of my love and condolences and support um, reach from me to you. And I can't even imagine the level of sadness and the degree of despair that you walk through from time to time. Um, only people who have lost children as you have could understand. But my advice to you is at least two or threefold. The first is you absolutely have to be in a therapeutic um, environment right away. This is not something you can just manage on your own. This ain't something you can just pray away, okay? And I'm, listen, I love the Lord and all that, but you need to be talking to somebody in your community who is a mental health professional, therapist, psychologist, whatever, so that they can help you process the weight of this grief. Uh, this is not something to play with. And then you add to that whatever postpartum and what, oh my God, 
you have to get in a therapeutic situation and promise me, promise me that you will. But the second thing I want to say to you is, I think you should surround yourself with people who not only know you, but who can speak life into you, who can not just monitor you, but more so encourage you. And that might be people who have also lost children, but it might well be people who love you. This is not a time to isolate. It's a time, even in the sadness, to have people that you can be authentic and real and sad in their presence, and they know how to receive it, huh? and to let it just be what it is. And I pray that you have people in your life who give you that grace. The book of Ezra in the Bible, Ezra's praying, and he says, and now for a space of grace. That's my prayer for you. And in the midst of this season, God would give you a space of grace to put your heart back together and to collect the pieces of your broken soul and to believe maybe one day soon that there will be joy after this. Okay? But we at the Book of Sean love you and we're praying for you. Let me take a break. We'll be right back with more Ask Dr. Sean right after this. Welcome back, everybody. I was telling Juan that last video almost made me cry right in the middle. <laughs> I was like, don't cry, Dr. Sean. Get through the answer. Anyway, so someone DM me this question. My best friend is having problems keeping guys interested in her. I want to tell her that I think it's because she brags to them about how much money she makes, her investment portfolio, and her big plans for her future. I think she makes men feel insecure, but I don't want to tell her um, to play it small for men. What is the best way to advise her? Well, first let me say that your intuitions are right. When you meet somebody, the third thing out of your mouth should not be how much money you have. <clears throat> the size of your portfolio and your investment stretch strategies. That's not how you want to connect with people. And if you want a real relationship, that's not what you sh should lead with. You follow me? Because if you lead with that, if that's what you put out there, then you're going to attract people who are only attracted to that. And that's not the recipe for long time, long term. What's wrong with my mouth? <laughs> it's this echo. Long term love. That's not a recipe for that. You see, you want people to connect with you because they care about you, because they have a sense of what you stand for, what you believe, your decency, your character, and all of that. It cannot be that people are impressed with your bank account and now they want to put a ring on your finger. If that's what's happening, then it's not their fault. You're not a victim. You're a volunteer. You're raising your hand and you're saying, I don't want lasting love. I want people who only are attracted to the things I have and can provide and never truly to me. And maybe that's what you should tell your friend. Now that I think about it, tell your friend the reason you don't have success in love is because you're leading with the wrong things. A man doesn't need to know how much money you make and you've only known, known him rather for a month or three months. Why does he need to know that? You don't even know this, man. That's also a recipe to put yourself in some danger because you'll mess around and meet people who want access to that money and will do things to you to get it. Yeah, you need to be honest with your friend and sort of set her up to be a better version of herself. Maybe you start by asking her, what do you really want? Because if you want to be loved and married and have a family, then what you're doing, what you're doing rather, <laughs> wrong with my mouth, is the antithesis of that. It's the complete opposite of that. So I wish you well on that because I want your friend to be loved too. I'm glad your friend has a great friend like you that wants the same thing for her. I would say don't be afraid to tell the truth. But tell that truth in a way that she can hear it. And the way she needs to hear it is, you are attracting 
what you're putting out there. Put something else out there, and you might attract something better. There you go. All right, do we have another video? I think we do. Let's take a look at this video. Hey, Dr. Sean, I'm JJ Grayson, and I'm in need of some advice. Uh, what are some tips you can give a gay black man about being their authentic self in black spaces, knowing how divided the black community can be about gay subjects? Great question. I love black people. I am black and I celebrate black people. It's not that I don't celebrate other people. I celebrate all people, but I especially celebrate black people. And I'm, I'm saying that because of what I'm about to say. You ready? The hell with black people. <laughs> the hell with, you don't need black folks permission to be who you are. You follow what I'm saying? Black folks are as wonderful and as flawed as everybody else. And you being your authentic self is the first responsibility that you have to you. You know, listen, you want to hold somebody's hand, hold their hand. You want to wear whatever it is you want to wear, do it. See, the more people show up as themselves, whatever that means, the more the rest of us have to adjust. And that's good. When trans people show up, when women show up, when queer people show up, when poor white people show up, it makes everybody else adjust. When black people and brown people show up, we all have to adjust. And we will survive the adjustment. Black people will get over it. Here's the other thing. That whole anti-gay thing, that's some old folks mess. Nobody 40 and younger of any significant number even cares. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, indigenous, whatever. The truth of the matter is, people who have a problem with you being gay are probably gonna be dead in the next 20 years. <laughs> so, you know, but they are not your audience and you don't need their approval, okay? They're trying to figure out burial plans and funeral arrangements and, you know, AARP and Obamacare. And I'm not knocking it, I'm all for it. I'm just saying, come on. Your generation, a lot of people in my generation, we are past this silliness. You follow me? You are made in the image of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the reflection of the divine. There is divinity in your smile. There is greatness in your choices. Your attractions, your desires, your orientation manifest the full panoply of God's diversity in creation. If no two raindrops and snowflakes are the same, then why should everybody be the same with respect to who we love? Diversity is the way of the universe, and without it, the universe would die. Which leads me to say this, without queer people, the universe would die. Without straight people and trans people and black people, white people, tall people, fat people, skinny people, people whose mouths are not working effectively tonight, <laughs> the universe would die. You are necessary absolutely necessary because there's a little gay boy somewhere outside of your view watching you and he is going to learn how to be himself by watching you be you <laughs> i swear i feel like though if i shoot <laughs> lord help. go to break highly i feel the holy ghost welcome back everybody so around here, we do a little special thing called, here's what doesn't make sense. So, did you hear about the noose that was found at the Obama Presidential Library construction site in Chicago? This is very interesting because the Obama Presidential Library uh, site is on the south side of Chicago right off Stony Island and not far from the University of Chicago, a community, by the way, that is extremely black and extremely diverse. So the Obama Library and the University of Chicago, to which it is tacitly connected, is in what's called the Hyde Park Woodlawn Community. 
I did my doctoral work at the University of Chicago, and I lived in Hyde Park, and I know this community very well. <laughs> so, um, the point I'm trying to make is nobody from this community were the ones who put a noose up at the Obama Presidential Library construction site. Barack Obama lived in Hyde Park. He taught at the University of Chicago. People in Hyde Park and Woodlawn love the Obamas. So nobody who lives in that area is putting a noose up at the Obama Presidential Library. Okay? Can we establish that point together? So this was somebody from the outside. This was somebody who doesn't live there, is not a native to that community, and probably somebody who's not black, who's using the iconography and the symbolism of bigotry, a noose, to perpetuate and to inspire hate. And here's the part that doesn't make sense. The people who put this up, the noose, actually think that they have some power to influence and intimidate black people when nothing could be further from the truth, okay? Just a word for the people who put the noose up. I'm talking to you now. The world has changed, my friend. <laughs> You're not the wolf and we're not the prey. Those days are over. The days when you could just put up a noose and expect black people to be trembling in their bones at the sight of the iconography of hatred. Those days are over. Your little symbolic threats are not making anybody quake in their boots, okay? You're not the wolf. We're not to pray. And quiet as it's kept, the truth of the matter is we were always lions. The difference is now we know that we are lions. And the last time I checked, Wolves don't do well in the company of lions. <laughs> so how about y'all stop it with the stupid stuff? Because even if you burned a cross and stood out on the lawn of the Obama library in white sheets, you still wouldn't be intimidating nobody. Because ain't nobody scared of you. Do you understand that? Okay. We ain't afraid no more. Not to mention the fact you'd be doing that on the south side of Chicago, which means you probably wouldn't get home or go home the way that you showed up. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that there. But here's my last piece of advice to you, whoever it was that put the noose on the Obama library construction site. How about you take all that energy and you use that energy to make your little life better? How about you stop thinking about us and start thinking about your little family, your children, your dreams, and your hopes. Because all that energy you putting into me is a waste of time. Because I can tell you right now, on behalf of Black America and Barack Obama, of whom I have no authority to speak for, we ain't thinking about you. Let's move on. <laughs> the University of California Academic workers at the University of California have gone on strike. These workers include teaching assistants, postdoctoral scholars, graduate student tutors, and all of them are demanding significant pay increases because they are claiming that they are struggling to be able to afford housing around and near the campuses that they work because a lot of those campuses are in the priciest neighborhoods. A lot of the campuses that could constitute the University of California are in expensive neighborhoods. A union survey which represents these workers said that 40% of the graduates workers spend more than half of their pay on rent and 92% of them spend more than 30% of what they earn on their rent. They're also asking for child care subsidies and enhanced uh, benefits for dependents and longer family leave. And here's the part that doesn't make sense. I can expect people to have to go on strike to get this at the University of Tennessee or the University of Alabama, the University of Mississippi, or the University of Georgia, but I don't expect people to have to go on strike to get more money to live and healthcare to help their children at the University of California. 
Now I expect some of these southern draconian states who don't claim to be progressive and liberal to not be up on what they should be doing. But the University of California? I'm just saying it. California's supposed to be progressive and with it, with it, bout it, bout it. Dating myself. Don't care. <laughs> but apparently, even at the University of California, you got to beg and go on strike to get a... See, I expect people at the University of California and California folks to know that you need to make more money if you can afford ever to live near the campus and provide the services that the university needs. I would think that healthcare would make sense and not a difficult position to achieve, but apparently it is. But it just goes to show you, it's often not where you are, but who you are. That's the problem. Anyway, thank you for tuning in tonight. My man Antoine's going to be all right. I'm glad he came tonight. I think we helped him. Open your mind, people. Admit the limitations, because that's when the breakthrough happens. The more honest you are, the more free you become. And freedom is waiting on you. Come on here. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Y'all be good to each other, all right? Be kind. All right. I love you. I love you. I do. Bye -bye.